All right, what's going on YouTube? So today we got a pretty good video ahead. Um, I'm gonna be doing a ruck interview with an old buddy of mine who is a Green Beret. Um, he is, he's got a lot of experience. He's a prior uh, Special Forces NCO who went green to gold and then commissioned as an EOD officer and now just recently uh, graduated the Special Forces qualification course for the second time, earned his, gray, his, earned his Green Beret for the second time, and is now a Special Forces officer. So I wanna say he's got like, I can't remember what he told me, I wanna say 16 or 18 years in service total, something like that, we'll ask him when he gets here. But he's got tons of good experience, tons of good information for you guys, anybody who has any sort of aspirations on uh, going SF, so. All those questions that you guys asked in the community section, um, I'm going to be going through most of those questions. You guys asked so many questions, so I don't even think I'll be able to get through all of them, which is great, by the way. But yeah, I'll go through all those questions, and I will pick the ones that I think make the most sense to ask, and uh, we'll get as much information for you guys as possible from him. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel, because I'm going to be doing future interviews like this. and. Uh, if you want to participate in the uh, question forums for future interviews, that's how you're going to be able to get the information to do so. All right, so what's up? I'm here with Drew. Um, we started our ruck march off. He was kind enough to come out and do a ruck march today, a last second. Uh, it was literally like an hour and a half ago where I changed it up on him and asked him if he wanted to come out and ruck, and he was like, hell yeah, I'm a Green Beret and I'm going to go ruck. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so we're going to start off with like a quick, um, a quick bio from Drew. He's going to give you his quick story here real quick. Yeah, so uh, I was an infantry NCO, obviously infantry junior enlisted soldier first. Um, I did a one-year deployment in Iraq with 3rd ID, went to SFAS right after that, went to the SFQ course, seven and eight graduated middle of eight went out to first battalion first group in okinawa spent approximately three years out there did some asia rotations philippines thailand nepal some j sets training missions um, and then came back to the states taught in the sf schoolhouse at the q course for three years in the 18 charlie committee um, and then subsequently went green to gold spent a couple years doing rotc commissioned as lieutenant branch dod went through uh, Ordnance Bullock EOD school in Florida, and then made my way back to Bragg, did about two years as an EOD platoon leader and operations officer, company operations officer, um, did one Afghanistan rotation during that time, um, and then recently went back to the SFQ course and just finished it and am now headed to seventh group. Oh man, so you kind of been there, done that. So how long, how long do you have total in so far? So I just hit 18 years earlier this month. I am 37 years young, and like I said, just went back to the SFQ course for a second time, pretty much in its entirety. So that just goes to show you that you can, you can be like an old man and still go out there and get it. You, you can, know, like, yeah. All right. It's not the preferred method, but it is possible. <laughs> So you've been through the Q course twice. Have. Right, okay, so did you have to go back through selection the second time? So I did not. Uh, my understanding is every year um, SF branch proponents see in conjunction with HRC basically uh, issues a milper message and that dictates the terms essentially of what the requirements are gonna be to come back through. So in the case of prior SFNCOs that want to come back to the course as officers. Every year there's a determination made based on strength and army requirements of whether those people will have to go back through SFAS. Um, okay. For the past few years, to include the year that I was coming back in 19, um, they did not require it. So when I went through SFAS as an NCO in 2006, that, still, that and then service in the SF regiment um, qualified me to basically put in my application 4187 and come straight back to the Q course as an officer. Which is pretty awesome. It I mean, is, yeah, absolutely. Legit. Would you have gone through selection again if you had to? I think I would have. So the yeah. whole plan was to go back to SF? Yeah, I always knew when I went green to gold that I wanted to come back to SF and then the whole career detour EOD had its own value and its own um, pretty interesting set of experiences, but uh, but yeah, I knew that I was gonna come back to SF. Okay. What made you decide to go green to gold uh, as you know, when you, when you were like an SFNCO, what made you decide to go green and gold at that time? So, um, there were a few reasons. One of them was uh, I always really wanted to get a college degree. I mean, that was a huge like life priority for me. 
And there were other ways to do that. It's not like you have to go green to gold, have to go ROTC as, a, as an enlisted soldier to get a degree. It was just the way that I thought made the most sense for yeah. me. Um, and then there were certain aspects of being an officer that appealed to me. Um, I wanted to, <laughs> you know, ultimately I felt that the NCOs, you know, um, in large measure manage execution of yeah. directives from from the officers, right? So you've seen officers, you know, a lot of us have seen officers who were effective or less so, um, and I wanted to be one of the good ones who issued sensible directives and gave, you know, useful guidance. So uh, I just, I don't know, man, I, I was inspired by some really strong officer leaders throughout my career, and I thought, hey, I could give that a shot, so. Okay, cool. So you went to Green and Gold. Um, you did two years in school, which we actually went to school together. We did. Uh, at Fayetteville State. I hope it's okay. Spent some time well. on this very yeah. trail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny we're still here, but uh, it's a small world, man. You know, time just flies. What made you decide? So, I know we had a question on if you could just go straight SF from ROTC. I think the answer to that is basically no. Yeah, just yeah straight no. Can't no. do that. There's no lieutenant in SF. Like you have to be the first lieutenant promotable on the verge of captain or you know a captain to go right so even though you're prior service you still have to play by the rules you still have to wait your turn and and when uh you still have to go serve as lieutenant in, in the big big army right absolutely and you have to wait until um you're eligible to go back through the q course and just to provide a little bit of like uh specificity on that for whatever expectation management for anybody who's considering that route I left uh, an 18 series job. So I basically left my instructor job at SWIC oh, in, hey. <laughs> in August of um, 14, went green to gold and then returned, came to soft triple C, start, basically started the SFQ course in November of 19. So a oh. shade over five years was the very fastest I could go from my old job as an NCO to coming back to the course. That was the quickest you could possibly do it. A little over five years. Okay. So you have to be willing, if this is some sort of route that you're looking into, you have to be willing to kind of give up a little bit of time for yeah, without to, to be able to get back. Yeah. It's like an investment. It is, yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of considerations that go into that. I mean, you gotta, it's, you gotta weigh like, how do you think you're gonna feel five years from now for the yeah. NCOs and a bunch who are looking at going green to gold going this route? I mean, because how old are you now? 37. Okay. It looks like it, right? No, he's still a looker. He's looking good. <laughs> when you were going through RTC, uh, what 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 was your plan for while you were waiting? Like, what branch did you want to go into while you're waiting to go back to SF? Um, so I thought about a few. I was kind of drawn to aviation. Uh, that seemed like an awesome career field yeah. for those of you interested in and or involved in aviation. I mean, being a helicopter pilot, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I thought about that. I thought about just going back infantry because that's kind of where I started before I went SF as an NCO. So it was sort of familiar territory. Oh, you were infantry before you went SF? Correct. Okay, yeah. we'll go back to that. Yeah. So um, later. <laughs> Ultimately, I decided to go EOD because I was an 18 Charlie in SF, so I had gotten some hands-on with demo and, and everything else, like principles of explosives, chemical energetics, and I was like, well, there's a little bit of overlap there. Chemical um, energetics. Yeah, so um, decided to go EOD, also found out that there was a pretty cool job here at Bragg um, to go deploy in support of SOF, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, went and did that, and I figured that that would be a pretty good lead-in to come back to SF. It would keep me relevant, it would keep me active, it would keep me, you know, carrying heavy stuff. Awesome. So how was that? It was awesome. Did you have to go to a selection for that? Yeah, they, they do an assessment. This unit uh, basically tries you out, and then um, you have to go through some training with them. But uh, but yeah, I mean, very, uh, very illustrious unit. They've done a lot of really great things, so. I was happy and proud to be a part of it. Yeah. So during, so you spent, so after you commissioned, you went straight into the EOD pipeline and at, you were telling me before, that was like 18 months total. Yeah. Something like that. It, yeah. With Bullock at Fort Lee, cause you got to just be an ordinance oh, yeah. officer. So you got to go through ordinance Bullock and then EOD phase one, which is like, a, I want to say it's six weeks five or six weeks something like that but it's basically the screener the army screener because eod is a joint school it's technically a navy school but all the services go to it so the army has their own screener to make sure that they're not um it's not a wasted investment on somebody who isn't going to go down to florida and 
probably be successful. So at Fort Lee, right on the, the heels of Ordnance Bullock, you go through this screener course, it basically assesses suitability, and then upon completion of that, you PCS to Florida, go through EOD school. So yeah, okay. it's about 18 months all told. Okay, and how was that, like pretty this, tough? Uh, yeah, it was interesting, man. It's um, EOD school has a ton of tests, and there basically are a lot of opportunities to go home. So, you know, you really kind of got to stay on your game. I'm actually kind of jealous because we went to school together and I was wanting to go fly. That didn't work out for me. And then I was like, okay, well, I'll just go EOD, no big deal. But then my year group, I was a year group behind, yeah. uh, about, behind him, and I, my year group wasn't selecting at that time. So I had to just go back to the infantry. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, really they weren't selecting for my year group. It's the only reason I didn't like follow in oh, your guys' that's footsteps. Right. They, they changed it up. <clears throat> from like pre selecting EOD to you have to PCS to Lee, be an ordinance bullock, and then interview into an EOD. Yeah, it was like totally, like yeah. I don't even think, no, I don't even think they were. They weren't taking any. These weren't taking EOD period for that year group. I think they were like over strength or something. That's I don't remember what it was, but I remember like, I just couldn't do it. Yeah, that's and so, it's but, but interesting it, job. I, I still had a really good time uh, being an infantry officer and all that. So no, no big deal, no, no hard, no foul. Sure. Okay, so taking a step back, um, since you mentioned it. So you were infantry when you first joined. Can you kind of just give me like the quick story on when you joined the army and when you first went uh, to selection? Yeah, I knew and when why. I joined the army that I wanted to go um, SF. Um, so you didn't join with an 18 X-ray contract? So I actually did, uh, okay. and I didn't make it through SFAS the first time. So there's a little there. nugget of encouragement. Yeah, there you go. He's never been in that boat. So yeah, I went to SFAS the first time in the fall of 2003 as a private, fresh, you know, fresh faced private in the army. Didn't pass land nav and then um, ended up matriculating my way to third ID, which is kind of, you know, the, the joke was that the 18 X-ray program is a feeder program for the infantry, yeah, because um, they certainly fill their ranks with 18 X-ray burnouts, but uh, <laughs> or washouts, I should say. But uh, anyway, I was in that population, so went and spent uh, all told about a year and a half in third ID. Like I said, did that one year deployment to Iraq and then knew that I was going to come back from that trip and give SFAS another crack. Okay. That time I was successful. Okay. And then you spent how long in, in, as an NCO again? Uh, I, so I started ROTC with 11 years in service. Okay. To, you know, with my three years of SWIC time, my instructor time rolled into that. So I actually commissioned on the 13th anniversary of the day I shipped for basic training. Okay. So 13 years in service was a brand new Cherry LT. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know how that feels. It's, it's, it's <laughs> a way. Yeah, it's a way. Well, do you have any regrets so far? No, I wouldn't say I've got any regrets. Things have, have turned out pretty favorably. Um, I think I've been pretty fortunate. That being said, I would do it earlier. I think um, I wish that I had recognized earlier in my career that going green to gold, becoming an officer was like a viable option and arguably the best option um, for me. And I just wish I had decided on it sooner and not waited till 11 years of active service to do it. Right. So Drew here failed selection the first time as an 18 X-ray when he first failed. joined the army. Hard F. He just failed it, right? <laughs> but he didn't let that get to him. He went back to what unit did you end up at? Third ID. Yep, third ID. And then he went back to selection, passed that time, served as a uh, special forces NCO, yep. and then went green to gold, went EOD, and now he went through <laughs> The Q course again, all the way over again. Yep. You probably the only thing you didn't have to do was SEER school again. Yeah, right? I, yeah. So like I Thank said, I, did, I didn't have to repeat <laughs> SFAS. They took it, you know, they took my word on it that I was capable of doing the job. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't have to repeat SEER. That's good for life. And <laughs> okay. You asked earlier if I would have done SFAS again yeah. had I been directed to, and it was like, a, yeah, I probably would have. If they had made me go to SEER again, I'd have been like, mm. yeah, that's that's a hard one. That would have that would have been a gut check. Yeah. Um, sure. I feel you on that one. But yeah, so that's pretty cool. So that just shows like the resilience aspect of the whole thing. Like you, you got to go in there with the right attitude. Like you got to want it, you know, yeah. even if there's failure involved, you got to push past the failure and just, and just make it happen. You obviously have like a lot of experience in the army as a whole. A lot of years have been dedicated to uh, special forces, right? Sure. But you have enough experience now throughout the army to have made a decision not to go back to SF if you didn't want to. So yep. what made you like, why SF? So in the, the Pantheon, $10 word, in, in the whole library of soft organizations, 
across the, the joint force. Um, for my money, SF, I think, is really the Swiss Army knife. Uh, meaning that if you have some kind of uncertain, um, kind of nebulous situation in some remote corner of the world, and the U.S. defense apparatus is trying to wrap their heads around exactly what the nature or, you know, the, the, uh, the overlapping nature with all the different players of what that problem set is. There is no organization that's better trained and equipped to go and diagnose all of those, those um, coalescing factors. So like nobody has a better tool set to go somewhere and just figure out who's who and what's what and what's going on and what what exactly this looks like and what other capabilities or assets need to be brought to bear to resolve that problem set. That's sort of, you know, SF is kind of the, the jack of all in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and it really is a broad mission set. I mean, there's so, like, anybody you talk to who spent any time in SF probably can attest to the fact that from one week to the next, one month to the next, the different outcomes for your what you're being asked to do and where you're being asked to do it and how you're you're kind of figuring out um, to tackle that problem set, there's nothing else quite like it. It's a, it's a big crazy world out there and SF is really at the center of it in so many cases. Yeah, even when it seems like there's nothing going on, there's always something going on for yeah, man. SF dudes. Yeah. Dude, the world is too complex, man. You got seven billion people competing for, for real estate. It's like yeah. SF are the guys that you kind of send there to be sensors, as we say in the business, like, hey, go figure this thing out and let us know what we need to do about it. Yeah. You mentioned that you were 37 years old. Damn. 37. Got that right. I remembered. Every minute of 37. Every minute of 37. Um, what? So, I mean, it must have been rough going through the qualification course for the second time, especially going through SET. Because even though you got to skip Sierra, I mean, it's still, it's not like it's easy, you know? Sure. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you're out here with a ruck on your back right now. What kind of, like, what kind of tips do you have for guys that are a little older that are trying to pursue these sorts of endeavors. I don't want to minimize or, or kind of understate um, the, the reality that there is a luck component. There's no doubt about it. Like two guys go down in the same way, one tears their ACL, the other doesn't. There's always a little bit of, of kind of chaos theory to the whole thing of like, how do you stay healthy? How do you stay habilitated to where you can meet all of the physical demands of, you know, these jobs, whatever it is, SF, or like you said, Ranger Regiment, or whatever it's going to be. Um, Beyond that though, there's definitely like a mental discipline component to it. I mean, you, there's some obvious stuff. You gotta stay active. Your diet needs to be reasonably dialed in. I mean, you don't have to be like a complete diet psychopath who yeah. counts everything or this, that, or the other. Like you don't have to be that dude, but it's also, I would say highly discouraged to just be the potato chips from the gas station. Yeah, like, yeah. It's kind of hard. Maybe turn the tornadoes down. Yeah, for a little sure, bit. man. The churros. Yeah, it's kind of hard to keep all your systems dialed in if you're not really conscientious about it. If you're not paying attention. So, paying attention to what you eat without being a psycho, um, staying active, working out, and then kind of reading yourself and not overdoing it, man. Like if you're the dude that's that takes six weeks off and then hits the gym and wants to deadlift, you know, 515 pounds, it's like. Hey man, you're probably not doing yourself any favors unless you know that you're built for that. Uh, in my case, I'm not, you know, I'm a smaller dude. So I think it's just compact. It's yeah, it's yeah, compact. <laughs> yeah, a lot packed in a small package, but um, so yeah, it's really kind of regulating your output, not overdoing it, but not underdoing it either. If that makes sense. I mean, that's pretty vague, but no, I think that makes sense. Like, did you ever feel go? So going back, I just keep throwing SET cause that's sure, like yeah. the most recent one for you. So yeah. like, SUT, like, did you ever feel like you were somewhat at an advantage over the younger guys? Physically? Like, mentally, I would say. Um, yeah, with, without a doubt, there's, um... Like, going through it the second time, was it like, okay, I kind of already know what I'm doing, or did you feel, yeah. like, more pressure because you're expected to know what you're doing, or how did that feel? Yes, yes to both. Um, so, there's definitely a little bit of a cheat code effect, um, and, you know, confidence is a function of experience, so the more you've done a thing, the more self-assured you are in doing it again. Um, so yeah, going through SUT the second time, having done it previously, there was, I definitely felt like, okay, I have successfully completed this before, so I know this material. There's no way I'm gonna fail because I don't know the mechanics of an ambush or, or whatever right. it is. Um, that being said, you know, every single dude out there had, had youth on their side. 
Yeah. Um, whereas I'm kind of, you know, I've, I've put a lot of city and country Out there with a the cane, just yeah, trying. <laughs> so um, I felt like it, it pretty well equaled out. Like whatever I thought that I imported in terms of advantage was sort of, uh, I had to measure that against like, well, you know, I got to keep up with these dudes. Like I'm the old guy, I'm not a big dude. I'm not a super strong dude. I just, I got to make it work. Yeah. For guys that are, maybe it's still just their first time they haven't even been to selection yet, but let's let's say they're an RTC now or they're earning their commission in some way, but they have some sort of aspiration to go SF, which we know a lot of guys out there are like that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what kind of advice do you have for them upon commissioning? Like what, do you have like a certain branch in mind for them or a certain training program, yeah, anything like that? that? I know that was a, a big, you know, a big item of curiosity for a lot of folks. Um, so I would, strongly advise ranching infantry going to ranger school trying to get to light infantry like that is the most obvious cookie cutter pedigree to come from to go into sf and then succeed in soft click three and everything else because it's all of the uh combined arms maneuver all of the mdmp well to some extent the mdmp but like troop leading procedures five paragraph off order just comprehensive detailed planning all of that dovetails very well in the career course and in the 18 alpha course from what you did in eyeball like if you're an infantry officer so from a technical and tactical discipline standpoint um that is the best lead in to sf is being an infantry officer that being said plenty of people succeed as 18 alphas who don't come from that background so if you have something else that you're really interested in i mean i've known aviators who subsequently came sf and served with distinction and succeeded and were very effective detachment commanders and like they were not limited by their background um eod officers you know that's kind of i can speak to that um you're gonna get something from every basic branch that the army offers so if there's something you're really drawn to i wouldn't discount that for fear that it's gonna hurt you if you decide to go sf later if you're a committed person and you're willing to put in the work um, and you have the tools that they're looking for, it sort of doesn't matter what background you come from. That being said, <laughs> if you're a Ranger Qualified Infantry Officer, the odds are in your favor, because that's the preponderance of guys who go 18 Alpha. So. Right, right. Um, in your class, did you have, in your in your 18 Alpha class, did you have, um, like what was the ratio between infantry officers and anything else? Just spitball, and I would say it was probably 70%. Ranger Qualified Infantry Officers who, you know, Okay. And, and striker PLs or light PLs or whatever. So st statistically, um, it sounds like it might be better to be infantry and you're going to get more out of it. But it doesn't mean like if you weren't an infantry officer that you don't stand a shot going. Well, so like, yeah, what? absolutely. Um, and I would <laughs> and I would kind of parlay that into the guys who guys and gals now. Um, but anybody who is uncertain or kind of worried that whatever their basic branch is doesn't set them up for success if you just focus on being good at your job try and give yourself a background in combined arms maneuver try and understand doctrine and really to the best extent possible as a lieutenant try to inter or as a cadet try to internalize the army lexicon like the army vocabulary for planning like if you can kind of talk intelligently and if you recognize that that that's a hole in your game because it is for everybody initially like nobody is born and starts understanding how to talk this stuff intelligently so you have to learn it and you have to accept it so plenty of people reject that and they're like i don't care about doctrine i don't need it like it is going to be advantageous to you without question to be able to speak doctrine so start internalizing that early in your career in rotc if you can um also 18 alpha vice straight up maneuver officer combined arms you know doctrine um you kind of got to develop the the gift of gab a little bit like not just the gift of gab but you got to be able to listen like you got to be a student of people and start inviting opportunities to kind of be maybe uncomfortable interpersonally or, or put yourself out there a little bit and really start hearing people and learning about people because the better you can recognize and kind of evaluate people's motivations and what makes them tick and what language they speak verbally and non-verbally, the better set up for success you're gonna be um, in, in the soft environment. Because yes, it's a technical and tactical, you know, technically and tactically demanding line of work, 
but you, you got to deal with people. I mean, it's a people business. So for anybody that's once they're selected, I don't think it really matters. What's the, what's the difference between the pipeline for an SF enlisted guy or an SF officer? Okay. If yeah, there is question. one. Yeah, sure. Um, the MLSs are obviously different, but generally speaking, broadly speaking, uh, the SF NCOs are going to fall into one of four um, technical fields, basically. You've got communicators, engineers, weapons guys, um, and then, who am I leaving out? Oh, the yeah, medics, probably the most important. Yeah, right? the So, um, they're all... There are different philosophies on this, even within the regiment, but basically the NCOs have their area of technical expertise um, and the Bravos kind of cover a little bit more tactical stuff, just straight up maneuver, because um, they're the assistant three on the team. So they're supposed to be providing, um, you know, consequential input to the team sergeant, planning cell, team leader, everybody else yeah. on tactical maneuver type stuff. But all of those specialties that's really kind of the day job if that makes sense so like an sfnco's job is to be a team guy first and foremost just be a member of a team and work collaboratively to try and diagnose and analyze and solve problems and then on top of that they have to have their technical or tactical um, area of kind of specialization so the medic obviously is going to be the dude patching somebody up if they're bleeding out or whatever or providing training um but their jobs are to be dudes on the team. So the 18 Alpha's day job is to be the planner, is to be the guy who corrals the staff planning process, MDMP, as it's sort of adapted to a detachment level um, and drive the planning process and then overall kind of authorize and take ownership of whatever that plan is gonna be. That's the day job. But really his job is to be the dude in charge, right? It's uh, no different from Army Leadership 101. It's like you're responsible for whatever happens or fails to happen on that detachment. So it, I answer that in a purposely broad way because it is, in truth, a very broad mission set. Like, yeah, I want to. I, I want to say it's probably fair to say that like every every uh, SF NCO or officer, regardless, probably has a completely different career story oh, than the next. Dude, you know, question. with yeah. how broad it is and how many different mission sets there are and how how dynamic the the job field is. Yeah. Um, but like as far as the qualification go course goes, so you're essentially doing it alongside, as, as like an alpha, as an officer, you do it alongside the NCOs and vice chunks, versa, right? Chunks of it you do. Okay. MOS is all separate. So, you know, the Bravos do their MOS right now. It sits at 11 weeks. Um, all the MOSs, the Deltas are longer. Their pipeline, I think it keeps them at drag for about two years old. Yeah. I think just their MOS portion is like... 10 or 11 months or something like that, whatever. It's it's long. Um, but in any case, Alphas, Bravos, Charlies, Echoes, um, they all spend 11 weeks in MOS, which is just with their MOS learning, whatever their technical skill is, or in the case of the Alphas, who have no technical skills, um, we just learn planning and do a bunch of uh, planning iterations and then a bunch of human engagement stuff. Like I talked about, key leader engagement training and all kinds of basically just being uh, thrust into uncomfortable situations and kind of having to navigate the, the interpersonal domain. Okay. Um, so yeah, that part is separate, but uh, tactical skills, what used to be called SUT, that's all, you know, all the MLSs together, Robin Sage, same deal. Yep. Um, SFAS is just a whole big that's just everybody's melting just, pot of yeah. people. Yeah, there's a person there you're for sure getting selected. All right, so now as a prior uh, SFNCO, what kind of skills have you picked up from there that you think are going to carry on and translate into being an SF officer? So I think that the probably the most the most value that I can add with that background is an awareness that SF, you know, team rooms in SF are full of legitimately some of the most enterprising and innovative and talented people you'll ever find. Um, so I am fortunate you know as a prior sfnco that when i go into a team room now as a detachment commander i can recognize and there won't be any organizational or rank related friction where i'm sitting there thinking like i've got to be the thinker in the room i've got to be the decision maker i've got to be the one who really asserts myself and you know if, if i don't drive the train then it won't go anywhere kind of an attitude that some officers fall into yeah. so in soft Generally speaking, the officer's job, the commander's job really is to 
allocate the resources, remove the, um, the obstructions, and just get out of the way and let the talent do its thing. Um, and that might not sound like, I don't know, it might not really sound like that difficult of a calculus, but it can really be challenging if you're a type A and you kind of want to get in there and take charge. You got to recognize if you're going to be effective in, in soft NSF, they're like the people who are working with you probably don't need you to tell them how to do what they're doing. They probably know it better than you do as the commander. So like you get them what they need, you minimize distractions and you just kind of let them loose. You give them guidance, give yeah. them just general purpose. Like, Hey, this is the intent. This is what we're trying to get and, after. I mean, obviously, like by like it's, it's not as applicable for you because you've already got some experience. But like your typical SF officer, you know, he's been through the Q course. He might have had some back end experience with the conventional army. But once he gets down to his team, it's like he's kind of the new guy. Whether he, it doesn't matter if he's a captain or not, those NCOs have been doing this for years, most likely. Yep. You know, Absolutely. so he's right. Like they definitely know what they're doing. And the officer's just kind of there to corral it and make sure that those decisions are happening the way they should happen. And, and then be the representative for the team. So, you know, it's kind of a, an age old adage. It's not any insight that I'm adding here, but like when things go well, you, you give credit to your team and you put them center stage and you go to your higher headquarters and be like, hey, look what this team did. Look what these guys accomplished. But then of course, you know, as they say, why we get paid the big bucks for all of you ROTC cadets out there, but, um, <laughs> you're on the blame line you know that's yeah. no secret i think everybody understands that like when things don't go the way that you and your team or your organization templated them you know you got to be the one that's, that that owns it and stands there on the carpet and it's like yeah i'm responsible for everything that happens fails to happen this thing really went sideways yeah for that's all you future it. officers out there that's that's your life for <laughs> forever it's I've, always your fault i've heard it said and this is a little bit grim so don't you know internalize it too much but I've heard it said that as a commander, you exist to be fired. <laughs> now, that hopefully is not the case in the majority of cases, but yeah. um, but that really that's is funny. the reality. It's like you're in charge, and if things don't go the way they're supposed to go, that's they're going to look at you. So get the guys and gals what they need, give them the guidance that you that they deserve, and then get out of their way. Yeah. Yep. Now that you've seen both sides as an NCO and officer. Do you think there's any difference uh, between obtaining specialized schooling or any sort of expectation between the two? Are you expected, so I know you've already got Halo school. Yeah. Are you expected to do anything else like dive or does that all just depend on what team you're going to? Yeah, it depends entirely on what team you go to. I mean, if you're a detachment commander, you know, 18 Alpha coming straight out of the Q course and you just by happenstance end up going to a dive team or you seek it out, um, plenty of people do that, then yeah, obviously you're gonna go to dive school. Um, there, are, there are some other schools um, to help with like some of the less, I don't know, shiny badgy type stuff um, that just kind of generally help with planning or the full range of military operability. Um, but generally speaking, from what I saw when I was in group, I think that a detachment commander would be wise to not really chase schools in the way that an NCO, it would be more permissible for an NCO to do. I mean, you, you gotta be there with your team. So right. if you're the one that's kind of gone and like, oh, I wanna go do this thing, or oh, I wanna go to Halo Jumpmaster or whatever, it's like, you're kind of putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. It's hard to be an effective commander if you're not there. So really you should prioritize getting your NCOs to schools that are going to enhance and refine the team's operability. Um, that's kind of yeah. So it's not nice it's less about you and more about the team. Yeah, like it, getting the team qualified because you're the one that's running the team per se sure. on on the top end of it. Yeah, Either you, the team is the executors, a, but if you send a guy to, to sniper school or or Sephardic or whatever, you know that's a capability that that guy or gal is now bringing back to the detachment that is going to have a force multiplication effect. Like that's yeah. a, a skill set that they can now impart to the guys. So you have to look at it a little differently. Gals. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> it shouldn't be you. You know, the detachment commander shouldn't be, you're not gonna outshoot your team. Um, you're not gonna outrun your team. You're potentially not gonna out anything your team, <laughs> except hopefully- Which would be a good thing. Outplan them. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a, a good thing, that's team. a win. And the team sergeant owns the team. I mean, let's be real, like it's the, the the overall vibe on that team, the overall personality of that team is shaped much more so by that of the team sergeant than it is the commander. 
so what would you say to guys that are on the fence that haven't joined the army yet but they're they have the opportunity to either enlist as uh 18 x-rays or to go to school and potentially you know go in it for the long haul and, and become an 18 alpha one day if they're on the fence of that and they're not really sure how to decide do you have any sort of advice for them on that decision I know that that's is, a tough that question. That is a broad, no, I like it. That is a broad, <coughs> philosophical, you know, challenging question. So I would answer that by saying that however you choose to give your life meaning is is the meaning of your life. You know what I mean? Like, like the meaning of life is whatever meaning you give yours. So if, unless, like unless, unless <laughs> you are a billionaire philanthropist or a world leader or a, you know, mega influential celebrity, all any of us can do is make small incremental improvements or degradations to the world around us. We can either make things slightly, possibly immeasurably better or immeasurably worse. And given those two choices, you know, I think the only prudent course the only honorable course is try and do your part to make the world that much better if you can. And this is absolutely a way to get after that. You know, however, whatever outcomes you meet, whatever direction your life ends up going, if you kind of get it in your head, if you start with the why and you're like, hey, I want to do my part to try and make things just infinitesimally better, I would say that this is definitely a very, uh, this is a very invigorating red pill to take. <laughs> okay, that was a badass answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've gotten our ruck in. Um, we're about to finish up here. And uh, Drew, like you've given us a lot of awesome information. I'm sure you guys got a lot of takeaways from that. Um, that was probably one of the best interviews we've had on Gritty Soldier so far. So thanks for that. Absolutely. Um, do, you, do you have any other uh, words of wisdom or words of encouragement for anybody um, that's trying to go special forces. Absolutely. So I'm going to shamelessly plagiarize uh, in the corniest way possible, but I think it actually applies. Um, Henry Ford said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And I think that that really applies to any endeavor in life, however challenging. So, uh, you know, I'm not by any stretch like an impressive human being and I did SF twice now and for anybody who's interested in doing it or you know has questions or whatever like it's a very doable thing it's very achievable you just kind of like i said you know you got to take the right pill and uh and go down that rabbit hole and see where it takes you and, and be willing to put in the you know the miles and be committed to it so very doable thing all right brother all right thanks a lot man absolutely dude. thanks all right. for having hey, me hey if you guys have any other questions um for drew or about SF that we just didn't touch, just go ahead and drop it in the comments. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe to see any future videos if you like this kind of thing. And uh, besides that, that's all we got, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, guys.